Hello, Microscopists. This is Eric Miller from Instructinate, and I thought I might start a short little series of videos examining and discussing scenes in movies and television where electron microscopes appear. Our inaugural edition is a good one, and we'll be looking at The Andromeda Strain, a slightly dull movie from 1970 and based on Michael Crichton's novel of the same name, which came out the year before. Like most of Crichton's work, it was widely hailed for being grounded in real science and having good depictions of that science. Anyway, in this movie, a satellite has crashed and people are dying, etc. So a group of hand-picked scientists rush to find out what the problem is in this super-secret, hyper-sterilized underground laboratory in Nevada that's designed to investigate any dangerous pathogens that are introduced from space. So with man just having landed on the moon, space pathogens was something that people were kind of worried about back then. So, in this scene, the characters are about to investigate the space pathogen in question, aka the Andromeda strain, using a transmission electron microscope, and let's see what happens. So we start off in the electron microscopy room. That is a good start. They even spelled it right. So right off the bat, we're doing sample prep, and this is fantastic. As all of you microscopists know, sample prep is 90% of the work, and this is very realistic to start off with. We've got an ultramicrotome inside a glove box. So as I mentioned, this special facility was designed to keep the material they were examining completely isolated from the scientists working there. So the sample was likely introduced into the glove box through some conveyor belt or something behind the wall. They didn't just carry it into the room and then shove it into the glove box. So back to the microtome. The operator takes a huge chunk off of the sample and the bald guy comments that it's too thick, which is spot on. Then they start getting some really thin slices going here, and the guy says he's going to set the thickness at 800 angstroms, which is 80 nanometers, and that is also dead on. That is exactly the thickness you would want for this type of sample. Eventually, they get to a point where they find a section that they like, and they stop. In my opinion, this is likely the best and most accurate depiction of an ultramicrotome in a movie ever. And it's also likely the only depiction of an ultramicrotome in a movie ever. So there's that. They want to take the sample out and put it in the TEM. And this is where things start getting weird. He takes a TEM grid, which supposedly has the good section on it, and puts it into this copper cap thing, and then shoves it into this vacuum tube that makes this, you know, sucking noise. This presumably sucks the sample down this tube and into the microscope. This is totally bonkers. So let's back up a bit. To start, this is a real TEM grid that he's handling here with these tweezers. It's a three millimeter copper disc with a very fine mesh on it and that the section sits on. This is great. I don't know what this copper thing that he's putting the grid into is, but it's not a TEM rod, which is what the sample has to go into. So to see why the rest of this sample transfer is silly, I'll give a quick explanation of the TEM sample rod. The grid with the sample on it goes into the end of this rod. The rod is then inserted into the TEM column in steps. The inside of the column is under high vacuum, so the end of the rod has to pass through an airlock. And there's this rubber O-ring here to keep at the back end of the rod at atmosphere and the in the front part of the rod under vacuum. Basically what I'm saying is that there's no real way of putting the sample into the TEM without exposing the sample to air for at least a little while. And up until recently at any rate, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but I do know of some TEM rods that can keep the sample in a little sealed chamber while it's being inserted and then you push it out of the chamber once it's inside the microscope. Anyway, even doing that goes against the whole concept of this fictional facility, which is designed to keep people completely isolated from the bad things. So for the purposes of this movie, the sample has to stay inside a box and not come out of it, even if that's how it has to go into the microscope. So while this started off very promising with the ultra microtome, this is getting less good now. So the guy at the console is instructed to start up the vacuum pump, and then we're shown the name of the model of this TEM. So I thought this might be made up for the movie, but maybe it's not. Uh, this is a Forgflow EMU-4B. Now, if anyone out there has, an ex has any experience with one of these, please let us know about it in the comments. Because uh, I think this is a real instrument 
but I could be totally wrong. Anyway, we get some pretty good shots of this instrument uh, from the back and from the side, and it looks like a real instrument to me and not a mock-up. Anyway, things start getting weird again when the main character here says, okay, Charlie, let's put it on the screen. And we look on the wall and get this precious image. So let's back it up again. The first thing I noticed uh, is this huge thing here over the fishbowl. So normal TEMs have this round chamber with a window in it called a fishbowl. And in the bottom of the fishbowl is this phosphorescent screen, which is green. The electrons coming down the uh, column hit the phosphor screen, causing it to fluoresce and light up green. So this glowing green thing here is supposed to represent that, but it's not a real thing. The other major problem we have here is being able to send the electron image to a television screen. Now, I might be wrong about this, but I did not think this was uh, something that was possible until sometime in the late 90s or early 2000s with the advent of digital cameras. So normally underneath the phosphor screen is a film camera where you can take still images. This is a special camera with special film that's designed to work with electrons instead of photons like a normal camera would. I have never heard of anyone ever developing a, uh, a film camera with electron sensitive film that would operate underneath the TEM. It just poses a huge number of technical issues for no real gain. So the only way to be able to film what was going on inside the TEM was to flip up the phosphor screen, uh, which you can do, and film it from outside the microscope with a low light camera and lens. But even then, I think it would be very difficult since the light from the phosphor screen is very dim and extremely delicate. Again, it's mainly with the advent of digital imaging technology that this is possible now. In 1970, I think this would be technically impossible to do, to put that image onto a big screen like this. Now, let's get to the image itself. So, we'll mention the good things first. The magnification marker is 79,000x is good. This is likely an appropriate magnification for this sample. The image is also kind of green, which is how a TEM image looks on the phosphor screen. Of course, why they're using a color TV for this, I don't know. A black and white TV would likely give you a better image, but uh, this movie is in color, so the screen should be in color, right? Yeah, right, whatever. Now things start to get weird again. The head guy says, run it through the computer for contrast expansion. Now for starters, this, com this TEM has no computer on it. It is all analog dials and switches. Uh, the type of contrast expansion he's talking about uh, only became a reality around the turn of the millennium. Again, digital imaging technology. The best thing they can do to expand the contrast of the image, which is already a hundred times better than most TEM images I've ever seen, uh, would be to play with the apertures or something like that. Uh, so the contrast is computronically expanded and somehow goes from black and green to blue and green. What? <laughs> So these crystals, which is the Andromeda strain itself, also appear rather 3D, despite the sample having just gone through the microtome. So I'd be interested in knowing how they achieved these 3D projection special effects in 1970, but this is totally outside the realm of reality and in no way represents a real TEM image, which is very, very two-dimensional, even if you're looking at crystals and things like that. Anyway, the last real thing of interest I wanted to point out was this other smaller, older, and sadder looking TEM sitting in the other corner of the room. And if anybody knows the type and the model of this little guy, please post it in the comments. We'd be interested to know. Anyway, what can we take from this scene? The ultra microtome was stupendous. This was great to see some real sample prep being done. The TEM itself was a bit of a letdown, and I know that there are plenty of ways that they could have made that part a bit more realistic, but a lot of this story, both in the book and in the movie, is really more about the advancements of science and scientific equipment and this fantastical facility, um, and being able to project the image on the huge screen in 1970 would have been pretty amazing. And it's also about 30 years ahead of its time. So although there were some really screwy things here, I'm going to rate this overall as pretty good. 
You don't see too many TEMs in movies or TV, and you never see an ultra microtome. So good job to the Andromeda strain. Now, if you have any movies or TV shows where an electron microscope is featured, let me know, and I'll try to take a look at it. This has been Eric Miller from Instructinate, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thanks.